Hey, it's Joshua. Um, since I made the hafting knife to a handle video, I've got a ton of requests for flint napping videos to show how we made the blade. I'm personally not the best flint napper. Um, to make a piece like this, I broke 20 pieces. So, I figured I'd get an expert. My friend Regan, who's now holding the camera, is doing a flint napping series for us. And it's going to be awesome. I learned most of what I know from him, and I learned also a lot from Paleo Man Jim's channel, so check him out. He is really awesome. Hey, everybody. My name is Regan Beeler. It's a beautiful day in January, 45 degrees. I'm on the patio of Bangkok City. Josh Hamlin and I are here to do a video on flint napping and welcome to back to 1129 BC. I'm standing on a pile of debitage of raw Burlington chert. Springfield and the Springfield Plateau has some of the fantastic chipstone resources. Uh, being able to take raw Burlington and work it into a pointer blade like this is absolutely fantastic. We have fantastic resources here. This can then be heat treated. Um, the great thing about Burlington is that it's a large lithic resource. A uh, nodular, uh, they can weigh 50 pounds, up to 50 pounds or more. Uh, one of the things that you have to look for in it is finding the heaviest, most dense, piece of material that you can find if you're out trying to find the resource yourself. After finding a large piece, then you can start breaking it down into spalls, and then from there go ahead and try to finish into bifaces. So once you start getting a piece worked down into a biface, at this point you could go ahead and then elect to heat treat it if you have those options. Uh, if you have access to somebody who is a flint napper that has a kiln, they can heat treat it for you. Or you can do small batches and try to heat treat it yourself with the resources you have at hand. Hopefully we'll be able to do a video of that coming up in the future, and that's one thing I do definitely want to uh, cover. If you have a really good resource of raw Burlington shirt, you don't have to heat treat it. A lot of the older uh, archaeological examples of the tools that ancient man used here in North America, Burlington was not heat treated. They used it raw. So if you find a really high grade resource, get after it, chip it. You can go ahead and finish up with preformed blades like this. Getting a decent width to thickness ratio, it's achievable with this resource in its raw state. Um, over in the case, I've got some finished points that I've uh, made. St. Charles dovetail, um, and then of course the classic uh, older points that you can do with this material when it's raw. Spalling it out, you get a chip like this, you're ready to roll with it. Uh, it's really uh, just a matter of being able to get the hunk of rock and start breaking it down using the tools that you have. You can use hammers, but if you use steel, Usually steel hammers need to be softened. It's called annealing. Um, the steel that we use today a lot of times is tempered. We want to keep it tough and strong for modern day uh, applications, but annealed makes it softer. You can use a, a larger hammer to, to be able to, to remove the flakes that you want. I also use some copper. Uh, one of my best tools is right there. It's an old soldering iron. One of the things we want to go over right now, Josh and I want to talk about some of the tools that are used for flint napping. Uh, 
ancient man was using natural resources. He was using round hammer stones, cobbles, and things like that that nature would have made from erosion and creek beds, rivers, and things like that to get them to a point where fit in the hand. It's just you pick it up, it feels natural, you take this and you just can start chipping away. Besides hammer stones, and I, I really think a lot of work was done with hammer stones because they were just everywhere. Um, man was always going to be by water, so he had this tool resource at hand. If he lost it, he could always pick up another one. Besides hammer stones, ancient man would have also used antler. Now this is a shed from a nice sized uh, whitetail deer. He would have taken where it came from the skull of the shed, he would have taken this area, ground it on a piece of sandstone to get it to a point where he could then use it. It's spherical. It works better for transfer of energy and the shock wave that's created when making a flake. Antler you can find here in North America. Oh, that was a lot nicer. Um, Antler was a really important resource for ancient man. It has enough mass and volume to where when you make your swing and your strike, uh, it'll catch the edge and it'll bite that edge and transfer the mass and velocity to make that shock wave to have that flake detach. You have to be diligent about uh, your edge preparation when you're using antler. It's a lot different than copper. A uh, little bit more care and time is taken when you're using antler. One of the things about antler and some of those things is that every once in a while you'll, you're going to have to stop, you're going to have to tune your tools. Uh, when it starts getting so eaten up by the edge, you know, this is cutting into it. When you're striking chert or flint or glass even, it's going to start eating that up. Every once in a while you're going to have to stop, you're going to have to grind your antler so that uh, you can keep it in good shape. It's almost that simple. It's just working it, keeping a good spear. The natural resources they had was antler, hammer stones, even sandstone for braiding. Instead of using that gray block that is modern, I can use a piece of sandstone like this again from a river. Nice and easy to pick up, easy to carry. You can even use it as a hammer stone. right there. Hammerstone and a braider. We've covered some of the tools. Here's Ancient Man's toolkit. Uh, Ancient Man would have had uh, from an antler the very end tying the pointy part. He would have broke it off, cut it off, whatever, and then take and ground the tip of that tine so that he could do the pressure flaking, notching, finish work. Uh, he can use it also as a punch. For modern day nappers, we have copper rods, copper nails, even a mild soft steel to do our pressure flaking. We can even take copper rods, pound them flat, and use those as punches. 
so that we can do our notching and things like that for getting good deep notches like that in this Andes point. Uh, this is reed spring, uh, fantastic material, and we'll talk about that more here in a bit. Uh, instead of hammer stones and antler, the copper end cap for rigid copper water lines can be pounded into a sphere, fill it with uh, some lead from tire wheel weights, just heat that up with a torch and pour it in so you can get the density and, and the uh, weight that you want. Uh, again, we talked about uh, the old welding uh, pieces of copper that you can find in like uh, uh, antique stores, flea markets, swap meets and things like that. A good hand wall for doing some big spalling. We've kind of covered that already. Modern abrading. This was an old uh, an old grinding wheel that got broke up. Uh, you know, instead of checking it, you can do a lot of good abrading with that piece right there. That'll abrade good pe big piece of hunk there. Uh, you get a lot of use out of that. Here's what a lot of nappers are using to braid with today. It's nice, it fits in your hand. Um, a lot of use for a long time with this. And it takes it down nice to where you can then take a bopper and get a good flake off. So, this is convenient, it's easy to use. After this tip wears out, I can go ahead and heat this up, take that copper cap off, get a new one, pound it into a dome, go ahead and pour the uh, lead into it and epoxy it back onto this handle. I'm going to keep this handle, I'll be able to use that for years and years. So that's what we're doing with tools these days. Uh, there's some people that set up other things. There's things like jigs for doing flutes and things like that. I'm not going to get into it. I haven't done it yet. Uh, most of my fluting has failed horribly with uh, direct percussion. Uh, that's why you don't see any Clovis points in uh, in my collection thus far. But uh, I'll get there one of these days. So there's tools. This is some material that I was able to score. Uh, here in Springfield, you just make some jaunts out, find some places where there's some rock that it's exposed in red clay. That's where the Burlington is. It's here on the Springfield Plateau. There's also some great resources down around um, the, uh, basically the plateau area of the Ozarks covers a lot of area. Blue Eye has a plateau that's high enough that has Burlington shirt. It's probably not as good a material as this. This is just really high quality, sought after. After you heat treat it, it turns that beautiful pink color. A lot of people recognize that. Uh, it's nice and glassy, homogeneous. One of the things you will have to look for is lines of crystal crystal pockets sometimes some of the fossils in it turn into crystal and that can be a challenge it, if it's not too big it can make a piece even more pretty if you're able to work around it um, sometimes you'll have pockets of what I call chalk and I'll show an example of that sometimes you'll have pockets of what I call concrete those are real challenges and can make a break a decent piece, but depending on how it's spalled and how it's worked. Okay, we were talking about, uh, we're trying to cover a lot of the aspects of flint mapping. Uh, we're talking about material also here in the Ozarks. I'm going to concentrate on that and stay focused on it because that's what I have at hand. Um, that's what ancient man used in this region. We've uh, talked about the Burlington shirt, the fact that it has a fantastic size. Uh, you can tell a good material by 
the fact that you hear that glassy ring to it. That is really high quality stuff. Uh, besides Burlington, Modern Man has glass. See the similarity between Burlington and the bottom of a bottle. Green glass works fantastic on making points. Pressure flaking is about all you're going to be doing with it. Very little percussion. Um, the different kinds of glasses that you have at hand are TV screens. Uh, an old TV goes to pot. Uh, this would probably just end up in the dump, sanitary landfill, or you can go ahead and get it, break it down and start working it, and get some good use out of TV glass because it works great. Now this is going to chip a lot easier than your Burlington shirt, especially the fact that my Burlington at this point is raw. And I took it right in half. Sorry about that. I was a little too aggressive, but that happens when you go from a uh, material that is dense, strong, uh, and then switch gears and try to go to glass. I am not in a glass mode right now. <laughs> Josh, sorry, I screwed that up for you, dude. <laughs> we also have some red tile. Now, this red tile was coming off of, I guess, the exterior of a building or some facet of that. Uh, this is going to pressure flake. You're going to be able to pressure flake this or do some light uh, do some light uh, uh, percussion with it, but pretty much pressure flaking is what you're going to do with that. Here's a fantastic point that uh, Josh is working on from that material. This is his work getting some nice cemetery out of that. Uh, it's got some good scar patterns going across it and I look forward to seeing how he finishes that dude out. That's going to be cool. Besides glass, Burlington, one of the other resources we have here in the Ozarks and this is going to be south of Springfield this is called Reed Spring Chert. Uh, you've probably heard Josh and you've seen anything that I've posted on Paleo Planet or the uh, Flint Napping Forum on Facebook uh, and the premise skills and Flint Napping. My work in Reed Spring. Reed Springs is going to come in two forms. This was a bedded um, material that was in the limestone strata and then in other places you can find it in nodular form with a cortex still on it but the limestone has eroded away just leaving these this from the bed still has cortex on it but this was connected to just inches inches deep and just yards to miles going into the limestone um, usually it's going to fracture from weathering and it'll come out in one shape. If you can get your hands on the nodule, you're going to be able to do some great work with it. From a nodule, I was able to do these two pieces. Uh, that's from nodule work. If you get large enough nodules, you can probably get them slabbed. And if you get it slabbed, you're going to end up with a really large piece that's going to give you a slab like that. From this slab, I was able to get that blade right there. And I'm just absolutely tickled to be able to get that out of a piece like that. It's just a real joy to work. Uh, other work that I've done from cut slab in the reed spring has been these two pieces right here has fantastic color getting notches like that again you're going back to punch work tool like this setting up 
to the inside and then making a strike to the top of it to start working your notches up. Some of the smaller ones that you can get from the bedded reed spring like this has been these two little guys um, and getting work like that out of reed springs is really nice material it's homogenous it's almost like working heat treated burlington it just chips really nice and you can get some really really good points out of it so that's the material that we've been working with. Safety is one of the things that you're going to have to really take into consideration when you're going after this aspect of flint napping. I have safety glasses on right now. I've got gloves. I've got leather covering my legs so that when I work this rock, uh, I'm not going to get cut. You're still going to get cut chasing after flint napping is just one of the things that happen. You'll get better as time goes on when your techniques come in. But I definitely want to make sure that you know to cover safety while you're doing this.